I like to tr try today an experiment in rapid induction, and then that might fail, and then we could fall back on it. You know? But I think that we haven't tried to push our format in any way. We're now feeling more confident in the, mm. like here at home base at the Esalen Institute. Uh, so this would be a quick one, two, three, where I would try to suggest some actual questions that you could respond to as if somebody in the audience had asked questions. You see what I mean? Trying to uh, a rocket boost rapidly into um, a designated point on a target, as it were. So the unconscious. Here's the one, two, three in summary. One is a theory, the bifurcation theory, that the unconscious was created one afternoon in a certain place. A curtain which then divided the conscious and the unconscious forever. An iron curtain in, in the species mind. And two is a question about the relationship between this bifurcation and other bifurcations. And then three is um, a theory which wouldn't have to be taken too seriously as to a particular relationship between this bifurcation and some other one that I propose for the sake of discussion. Well, all of this is very hypothetical. So, one, the unconscious. Well, I gave a talk recently in the History of Consciousness program at the University of California, Santa Cruz. That's the most successful program at UCSC, internationally known graduate program thousands of applicants every year for a few places. So to begin with, I, I challenge them to change the name from the history of consciousness to the history of unconsciousness. So as long as we restrict attention to a historical period, then there's not much to say. But all the interesting events I want to point out are prehistoric, so therefore we have to speculate. Among the possibilities are that the conscious mind developed from the unconscious mind. Another one is that the unconscious mind developed from the conscious mind. And another one is that consciousness existed always and that there was never any division, all these possibilities. So for the sake of discussion, I'll choose one, my favorite one, but only for today. And that is the consciousness is always and the unconscious is recently created. So that we can view it like this, where we have consciousness going on and then the unconscious begins one day, created by an accident in a historical accident or a natural law of evolution. In this fantasy, however, because of peculiarities in conscious, uh, in the evolution of conscious mind and culture and civilization and so on, more and more things were regarded as illegal in the cur current world view and by the paradigm rejected from above the curtain to below, so that as we go along, the uh, unconscious begins growing from modest origins. Well, the conscious mind correspondingly shrinks. So eventually, it looks more like this, where you have conscious, conscious, unconscious, but this is growing. And in its growing, um, evolution, further bifurcations, morphogenesis, and uh, emergence of form, in the unconscious, so all what we identify today as fundamental deck furniture of the unconscious, the dreams, the archetypal symbols, and so on, all of that is evolving, has evolved from simpler origins, and so on. And this history of the unconscious we, we seek to discuss. So I'll call that the bifurcation theory of the, the unconscious. Now one virtue of this theory before going on to number two is that um, allows us to see our conscious mind in evolution from a universal conscious mind. Um, the Gaian mind is then regarded as conscious. The animal mind is conscious. The mind of plants, all of the, we can speak of the consciousness of animals, the consciousness of plants, the consciousness of Mother Earth, the consciousness of Father Sky, the consciousness of their partnership in the nuclear family of the all and everything. And this is um, valuable in, if we could promote this somehow in terms of our future and relating with respect to the mind of all the other entities. Now, number two, this question is about the relationship of this bifurcation in the history of consciousness and 
other bifurcations in in the history of ideas, such as the fall of Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, the fall of angel, uh, archangel, or Lucifer, other angels, and so on, the creation of the devil, the growth, the emergence, and the importance of evil, the empowerment of the negative mammon, and so on. We have a lot of other dichotomies which might have emerged from a unity by a process of mitosis, as it were, in the world of ideas. Then we can try to relate these bifurcation events to each other in time, or in space, or as waves, or causal relationships, or whatever, your favorite ones. The third, just for example, I'm going to recommend an example which, for me, was the source of my thinking about the history of unconsciousness in this way. So this is a specific hypothesis on the creation of the unconscious by the rejection of something, according to a dogmatic paradigm. And this has to do with um, Marduk and Tiamat, the first creation myth that I know about that has the subjugation of chaos by a law and order executive, a cosmic god, the, the war uh, between chaos and cosmos, won by cosmos, the king of law and order. The first one I know about is Marduk and Tiamat, and this is, is historical and is written on tablets. It was part of the Akitu festival that I always talk about. It was celebrated for 2,000 new years in a row throughout Babylonia by the Akkadians, the Semitic successors to the Sumerian civilization. And uh, in this horror story, repeated every year and actually acted out by the king playing the role of Marduk, Tiamat, a dragon, goddess of chaos, is actually divided in two, murdered with a sword and stretched. Uh, the two halves open like an oyster shell, forming the sky and the earth as the beginning of the, the Babylonian creation myth. At, at this time, this ritual, so uh, in, in a time when rituals were performed well and successfully in stabilizing the evolution of culture, chaos which is essential to life and happiness, was subjugated. But we experience it all the time, but that was not allowed by the paradigm. And in this myth was created, I claim, the unconscious, the negative charge on the serpent image, uh, the snake and the guy the, the innocent, the essential symbol of Mother Earth itself, the consciousness of Gaia, that this symbol came to be associated with Hades, um, with evil, with uh, terrorism, with Pluto, with the torture of Erish Kigo and um, uh, submitted uh, or, or the torture of Inanna by Erish Kigo and so on in the underworld, somehow is associated. Uh, chaos goes to the basement and with this gesture created the bifurcation in consciousness, giving us the unconscious, which appears to be gaining ever since. And in this gain, also, our life, our history of the human species, going in more and more into the evil, the demonic, uh, the evolutionarily unsuccessful forms of society. That's the one, two, three of it. I see. So you're in favor of a kind of fall theory of the unconscious. <clears throat> yes, one from which, uh, if we adopt it, we could seek uh, also to escape, and we would have a mechanism to escape, because we have a historical map, as it were, of the creation itself. How would this escape happen? We would bring unconsciousness back into consciousness. We would take the deck furniture from the lower floors of the boat back up to the deck where it belongs. We would take back what's happening if, I mean, this is just an example of the chaos theory of the bifurcation or creation of the unconscious. In this case, we see that science, which is the main temple of law and order, is now having to eat humble pie and to accept chaos again. That's a good thing, I think, for our future. And this good thing is apparently happening more or less accidentally. But suppose that we had this talk in 1960, and we decided that we would try to do something which would, something intentional, to restore Tiamat to her throne, mm -hmm. to bring up chaos from the unconscious and make it okay. Then we'd hunt around, so these computer people, we'd locate Ed Lorenz, 
we'd popularize his model, we'd revolutionize the sciences on purpose in 1963, instead of waiting for it to happen spontaneously in 1973. And if we'd done that, we'd never know but that it would never have happened without our intentional intervention. Mm -hmm. Now, I'm not recommending an intentional intervention. I'm just saying that if these, some of these things are brought into consciousness, that the little that we do uh, in our lives for the future generations, it consists of this discussion alone, maybe all that takes, you see, to bring something back from the basement, to put it in consciousness, starting a new upward spiral somewhere in the evolution of the spirit. Well, could, could it be that the unconscious was created? Could it be that there was a time in history before which there was no unconscious, there was no split, there was only one, which you wouldn't know whether to call it conscious or unconscious. I mean, we don't know what consciousness means, except to say it's the other one from unconsciousness. What do you imagine caused this bifurcation? I don't know. I, I know that in historical time, we have this horrific story uh, Babylonian myth in the sense of myth as the lyric of the opera which is a ritual and that all the rest of this story had Sumerian precedence and this part didn't so I'm not able to say to speculate that this had a 2000 year history before Marduk mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. The Marduk was the city god of Babylon and there was a time when Babylon didn't exist other towns existed. Eridu existed in 2000 BC. Ur existed in Sumerian time. And they had their city gods. Every city in that early urban revolution, every city coalesced around a god or goddess. And the form of the goddess was materialized in the form of the city. And this is the whole idea of the sacred city. The god concepts or goddess concepts which were successful, which were attractors, created cities and the other ones didn't and you had therefore a kind of a morphogenesis in the full complex of population movement urban technology city design and religion ritual and so on and the successful ones accreted with other ones and syncretism was the way in which empires were created so before 2000 BC we didn't have Marduk this didn't exist uh, Belmoradach, he was called, and this was a synchronism from uh, previous elements. So, there are, there are books about the serpent, about dragon image in mythology, and many cultures have dragon images, and they're all associated with chaos, and basically they're okay. Suddenly, we have Saint George killing the dragon, we have his Saint Michael with his foot on the dragon's throat, we have all this energy given to killing the dragons in uh, Celtic mythology in England coming over into Christianity and so on. Now, I think it's important that that be undone. I think we want St. George and the dragon getting it on together in a May Day celebration where Dionysian elements are accepted. I think that it's possible that this particular bifurcation has to do with the patrilineal necessity of knowing who is the father of the children and therefore the rejection of the ritual in which sexual license was an important part of the play and that this patrilinear structure involved with the creation of the nuclear family brought about the rejection of the dragon Mm -hmm. and the killing of the dragon and so on. But this is a speculation I'd, I don't know. Lately I've come to think it'd be nice to have a competing theory. I'm not sure we can blame everything on the patriarchal structure. But now you're suggesting that it was the concern for male paternity that drove the breakdown of this whole... That killed the goddess, yes. yes. We couldn't have this goddess around who liked to seduce young men and so on. Well, this... The suppression of psychedelics it comes at that same phase because the orgies driven by the psychedelic religion completely frustrated that desire to identify male paternity. The rejection of psychedelics and shamanism and so on could be likewise associated. So now we're getting a certain 
collage of bifurcation events. Mm -hmm. And uh, only so-called primitive societies have shamans. They have psychedelic rituals on a weekly basis, and they believe that uh, spirits are alive in rocks and plants, and they believe this because they've seen them, and they believe in the reincarnation of the spirit, and that um, uh, a human soul could reincarnate in an animal, and, and so on. So a whole com it's possible that a whole complex of things all disappeared at the same time because of some evolutionary selection, some unnatural selection, as it were. And it might be important to tr try to figure out the mechanism of this fall, because this is a really big fall. And now, since these thousands of years, we're suffering from the loss of this whole complex of ideas together. And I don't know if there's any one of them which is, is the cause. I'm not sure they were simultaneous, or if there was one place in the world where they were simultaneous. I can't accept blindly the theory of the Kurgan waves, the three Kurgan waves, and so on. I think that over time, these mushroom-using people in the Sahara were transformed unwittingly into mead cults by a scarcity of mushrooms and the recognition that honey was a potential preserving medium for the mushroom. So as the mushrooms became rarer and rarer, the effort to preserve them in honey and to concentrate the use of them into large festivals uh, intensified. And finally, what you had were mead festivals where mushrooms were no more than a flavoring and ultimately no more than a memory. And that the shift from the psychology of a psilocybin mushroom cult to the psychology of a beer mead intoxicating cult is precisely the difference in emphasis of inner dynamics that would shift you from a partnership arrangement sensitive to social cueing to a patriarchal relationship insensitive to social cueing which is precisely the effect so first the out. mead then the patriarchy the patriarchy and the mead and evolve together along with the concern for male paternity. It had to do with the suppression of orgies. This was a critical decision that had to be faced. Basically, the choice was between fun and full knowledge of the flow of your genes. And once it was decided that male paternity was an important issue, then the concept mine comes into existence. My women, in this case. My women, and then my children, and then my food, my weapons, my land. And this was the whole thing which this orgiastic, psychedelic, boundary-dissolving mushroom religion was uh, holding at bay. It was literally a pharmacological intervention to keep that kind of a psychology from getting Well, maybe going. it was an accident. You see, an accident in the kitchen that mead took over just because, well, the climate warmed up and there was no other way to preserve it or, or something. And after the mead entered the kitchen by accident and then all these other shifts followed. So this would be an alternative to the Kurgan wave theory. This is an alternative to the Kurgan wave Well, I theory. like that. I like that, Terence. I think we need an alternative. Well, you see, it would happen quite naturally. You have this flourishing mushroom cult on the plains of Africa, and then the drying which created that situation continues, and you get, first of all, seasonality to the mushrooms. So that's all right. You just have these wonderful, huge, seasonal celebrations and your psychology can be basically intact but then as the drying continues and the water holes are further and further apart the need to preserve the sacrament and to spread it ever more thinly I mean this is how so this is the only scenario I can imagine by which psychedelic mysteries are lost is if they actually slowly fade from the zone of occupation of the culture using them and a substitute slowly takes their place 
in a way that is at least satisfyingly... Uh, uh, booze. Booze. They went from yes. an ecstatic goddess cult of orgy to a drunken revelry of so this warriors is a two phase, and whores. A two-phase theory, the psychedelic partnership phase or the alcoholic dominator phase. This is one drug driven phase transformation repeating itself endlessly, flip flop, seesaw in the history of consciousness. I like that. And there's historical evidence as well in Crete, where we see this phase reversal phenomenon went on into historical times ending there because the Dionysian ceremonies were apparently debased into alcoholic uh, revels. And Orpheus was a reformer, trying to get the Dionysian religion back on track, as it were, with psychedelics and away from the booze. And it happened again with Pythagoras and again with Buddha. And, well, and it and happened so with Dionysius turning into Bacchus. Into Bacchus. The, the, and then it was the vine. It was wine. In the fact. early Bacchus is a frightening figure whose practitioners fell into such frenzies of ecstasy that it was charged against them that they devoured their own children. The late, hairy-footed, lascivious Bacchus is simply an image of the alcohol consciousness made the concrete. You know. So if we took this theory seriously for a moment, which we won't too seriously, <laughs> for this two-phase theory, and then we favored one phase and we're in the other phase, and then we would seek the mechanism of a phase transition as you turn on heat under water and it boils or something. Then we would try to get psychedelic drugs back into the agenda and somehow <laughs> get rid of alcohol and um, this would then explain why alcohol is legal and marijuana is not in these societies and so on is there is some self-preservation function there's a phase maintaining mechanism within this phase, which has made it dominant this well, past it's six thousand years. Well, it's because it reinforces male dominance because why? 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 Because if if you technically analyze what alcohol does pharmacologically, it actually does diminish sensitivity to social cueing. This is a technical way of saying you turn into a boor and an oaf. Zombie. Uh, no, uh, a, a libidinally driven oaf is what you turn into. And because you now have a reduced sensitivity to social cueing and you are your normal um, good sense is impaired, you're prepared to make a sexual conquest. And most of the sexual neurosis of the Western civilization can be traced to incidents of early sexual imprinting in the presence of alcohol. How many women lose their virginity in an ambiance of a drunken, groping encounter? I mean, this is how it is normally done in the West. So that alcohol is so spun into our simultaneous terror and attraction for the sexual experience that it's just become scripted in as part of our cultural neurosis. I'm willing to bet that for a thousand years in the West, nobody got laid who wasn't smashed. I did. This was, it ends, the period I'm talking about ends before you were born, Ralph. <laughs> So it's well, just a matter of, there's a good, um, you know, a point for the discussion. The way in which our relationships to the material world, specifically drugs, promote or retard the expression of what we're calling the unconscious. Because one of the things that I think repels us all about drug abuse is that it is unexamined, unconscious behavior. And uh, it's worth thinking then about how the unconscious is, in a way, an out of Tao relationship to the exterior world, because we can call it forth. You know, we can addict to heroin or television and turn 90% of our lives into an indwelling in the unconscious. Yes, well, I do this in my own life. I feel that I'm unable to become unaddicted, totally unaddicted. But I could be addicted to this or that. Right. So after I figured that out, I decided not to be addicted to chocolate, ice cream, alcohol, and a whole bunch of other things. And 
it seems very easy to make these choices. You can replace something with something else. You just touch it, and it's attractive. So then you get pulled away from this one to that one. Could this um, then be inserted in our educational system, rites of passage and so on, so that people know that they have a choice, and they don't have to be addicted only to alcohol and not to anything else, and so on, that they could actually choose reclaiming free will without rejecting addiction. This is what it has to be, because this is the kind of creature we are. And the, the, the addiction of addictions, which spawned this itch originally, is no addiction at all, but rather our natural connection into the hierarchy of Gaian information that was accessible to us when these nature religions were freely practiced. A sacrament is not a symbol. And the day they were able to sell people on the notion that a sacrament is a symbol, they severed the umbilical connection to the logos and then ran off the track and screwed yes. everything up. Well, to get back to the conscious and the unconscious here, I, I think it's not necessary to destroy the unconscious or to make everything unconscious become conscious, but I do think some growth of consciousness could be associated with some shrinkage of unconsciousness. And if we can't undo this bifurcation in which the curtain was developed, at least we could, we could rearrange the furniture a little bit. So w w we see one, one way that might be relevant for doing this is giving people a wider choice of ad addictions. And in this sense, a restrictive society which narrows the choice of addictions is somehow anti-evolutionary in that promotes the growth of unconsciousness, insensitivity and danger to life and limb of the biosphere and so on. But um, what, what could be done besides, you know, so somehow diminishing alcoholism in society? What, what could be done for the advance of consciousness to develop kind of telescopes, little stellarators where we can look into the unconscious and regain. I mean, dream analysis just doesn't really do it for people. Well, your idea, Rupert, about the age-related reestablishment of shamanic sacraments might come in here. I think so, yes. This, this is this idea that came up at Hollyhock uh, recently. Legalizing um, psychedelics in an age-related manner. Already, we have age-related legislation. Before 18 in Britain, it's illegal to buy and consume alcohol. After 18, it's okay. Before 16, it's illegal to buy and consume tobacco. After 16, it's okay. So, now what about legislation? At before 30, it's illegal to buy and consume mushrooms. After 30, it's okay. Before 40, it's illegal to buy and consume, say, um, LSD. After 40, it's okay. 50, DMT, etc. There's a series of age-related, initiation-related legalizations, and your ability to purchase the substance legally after you've reached that age depends on being initiated into it. You have to go to the held at weekends, a place like Ashley and Hongkong, etc. And, the, you know, your friends for your 50th birthday know exactly what to do. They'd have a whip round to subscribe to the price of a free gift voucher for a DMT initiation valued at either Omega, Ashley and Hongkong, or... The New York Times. Yeah, this is a vision, you understand. <laughs> anyway, there's an initiation. So there's a series of openings into other realms of perception. But you see, I don't think that the problem is so much that the unconscious is a kind of conspiracy or fraud. It's the fact that the whole way that nature works in all aspects is through the whole formation of habits. And as we know from our own experience, that habit formation involves going into unconsciousness, the principal model of which is habituation, found among animals right down to the level of stentor, you know, unicellular ciliates. Habit habituation, where, like when we go into a room and there's a funny smell, you notice it, then after a while you stop noticing it, the background noises. But habituation is the way we actually personally experience and share with mm -hmm. the entire animal kingdom by going into unconsciousness of um, a large part of the environmental stimuli and what's acting upon us. And it seems that the focus of attention is always quite narrow. What sensory systems and unicellular organisms do right through 
the animal kingdom is to see differences. You know, differences in smell, differences in temperature, differences in pressure when you move your finger over something. All sensory systems, differences in movement. Uh, sensory systems work on differences and what become conscious of differences. And they're on the surface, it's as if it's on the entire surface of a largely unconscious system. The, the shimmering surface, where you notice differences, there's a kind of awareness or consciousness of differences, but the heart of the whole thing is unconscious habit. And the heart of all living systems is unconscious habit. However conscious we become, we don't become fully conscious of the unconscious embryonic habits that formed us and, and the unfolding of human instinctive and cultural habits that have so conditioned our development and our, our culture. So there's these habits are uh, inbuilt in the whole of nature, and I don't think there's a kind of sinister conspiracy of unconsciousness. Um, it may be that a sharper awareness of the interface developed at some time, I, I don't know. I mean, maybe, um, perhaps through psychedelic visions themselves, the sense that in certain moments you're conscious of things that in other moments you're not conscious of, you become aware of beings and entities and dimensions, etc., which you're not normally aware of. So, it's not that you're conscious all the time, you're conscious sometimes. The fact that when you start from habit, that habit is a natural process that occurs in all nature, shimmering on the surface of the habits of atoms, of molecules, of crystals, uh, disruptions and chaotic perturbations, and so on, like crystal faults and fractures that make each crystal different from the kind of static form. There's, and there's a kind of consciousness associated with these discontinuities and differences. Um, so everywhere there's this kind of um, awareness of difference, which is the kind of consciousness level, but below that is a large underground thing of habit or unconsciousness. And there's a sense in which shamanic journeyings, uh, ritual practices like an annual liturgical year, where, like still today, September the 29th, the festival of St. Michael and all angels, liturgies and masses for the angels said all throughout the Christian world, a day of invocation and hymns to the angels. It's a day on which you become particularly aware and open to and invoke and talk to and communicate with the angelic orders. There's a day for it. It's there today. It's practice. Um, then there are other days, like All Souls Day, when you communicate through requiem, requiem mercy masses and relate to the souls of all the departed. Then there are the various saints' days that relate you to the lives, the lights, the kind of, as you were saying this morning, each saint representing a kind of Christianization of a sort of spirit principle, or in some cases even nature spirit principle. Um, the so green men. The green men, and so on. Yeah. So you have all this going on. Mm -hmm. So I think that somehow there's the sense in which through liturgies, through rituals, through psychedelic visioning, it's possible to come to bring to awareness with a whole liturgical calendar these all these different qualities celebrated on different days throughout the year. This is found in Bali today in the Catholic calendar, you know, saints' days and observances throughout the liturgical calendar, and in the major festivals, the solar and lunar festivals like Christmas and Easter. Um, so there is this uh, awareness through ritual of all these different dimensions. They're brought into awareness, they're normally unconscious, but there are particular days in the year when they're brought into consciousness. You can't be consciousness of everything all the time. We have a limited focus on awareness or attention. So you're saying the calendar can be an engine for uh, illuminating the, the calendar of rituals yes. that mm -hmm. ach actually achieve opening. Yeah, I, I think that the the theory of habituation, like sensory inhibition, mm -hmm. is um, it's a good model for the mind in which the um, the whole thing is viewed as essentially unconscious and that consciousness is a little window which roves over and could be redirected at will by a ritual or something at a certain part of the unconscious which would then become by a voluntary choice conscious for a day it would have its day of days yes the unconscious that I was speaking about before is a region of this whole thing in which the contents have somehow become unavailable. And it's the unavailability that I would identify that as the ultimate unconscious. Let's call that then the unavailable unconscious. The unavailable unconscious has been growing since a certain time in, in history. 
where it's, it's not possible to row the window over it anymore because it's been declared illegal. Terra and because it doesn't need to. I think perhaps because it doesn't have its day. Yes. The orgy principle had its day and still does in Indian holy festivals, you know, yes. and, and throw those around and have panic processions and so on. So, and reversals of the social order, those kinds of things are very alive in India. Um, there's all these different principles throughout the year, which we find mer mirrored in Carnival and Mardi Gras and so on, the same kinds of festivals, you see, suppressed in the Protestant countries through the Reformation. So no longer did the goddess have her day in the, in the various Marian festivals, all these female saints and, and um, St. Francis and all the rest no longer had their days. The eight days of the angels were not observed. Only the most important biblical festivals, like it, um, Easter and, of course, uh, Christmas. And, then, and uh, so there was a great shrinking of the number of observed days. And, you know, and so Mammon doesn't have an observed day, and the goddess doesn't have an observed day. And all these principles are entirely unconscious in our culture because they're not collectively and publicly observed. So I think that um, probably the traditional model for bringing to consciousness what is so largely unconscious, not necessarily through an evil conspiracy or names of ignorance or anything like that, but simply through the natural tendency to habituation observed in the operation of all sensory systems everywhere but things that remain the same are not perceived whereas differences that there are so unconsciousness proceeds by a lack of attention as it were only by focusing attention and having days and special rituals and so on we could maintain consciousness we would have to work at the maintain maintenance of consciousness as we work at the maintenance of the garden keep yes. weeding and watering and so on. And these mythic festivals you talked about were obviously a way of doing that. You reenact yes. every year the drama of the myths. Yes. So that you bring the myths to consciousness and make them yes. seen by the senses, heard, enacted and real in the sense of the king's consecration, the his or whatever. Yes, um, well... So, that it's, and it happens on particular days in the year, that's how it works. That our attention is selective, and this has always been based on seasonal and festivals and liturgical calendars. So you're saying everything tends toward unconsciousness, and it's only by this uh, act of awareness pushing against this universal principle that we illuminate phenomena in consciousness. Yes, and I think this relates to Ralph's model of the spirit, which, where he told us that on the one hand you have the, the soul, and on the other hand what you have, the body, and the spirit's what mediates between mm -hmm. them. Well, in, it's interesting in the late medieval or renaissance theory, or certainly the 17th century theory, the animal spirits were what mediated between the psyche, the soul, or the, um, uh, of the person, and the body. They were in an intermediate position, the animal spirits. Nerve impulses were thought to be due to animal spirits by the cut. So the spirit is, in, if it's the surface or the interface between them, then it's that part which picks up differences, and in which differences can only be known through an awareness of differences. The only way difference can be perceived, or you have to have a larger space within which it's seen as a difference. And that means difference is defined relative to non-difference, or sameness, or, or steady habit, or whatever. It's measured against a background of unconscious habit, which isn't changing. Mm -hmm. Or by clock time, as a model for that. Mm -hmm. So, you, that it's differences, and it's, it's therefore differences that would be observed throughout. Guy would be very conscious during ice ages, because mm -hmm. things would be changing at the beginnings and the ends of ice ages. There'd be a tremendous difference going on, and Guy would come to a higher consciousness, as Guy must be coming to a higher consciousness now through these large ecological changes. So that history is triggering this awareness? Something like that. that it's to do with differences, and it's to do with rates of change that consciousness or awareness are concerned. You know, in sensory physiology, the whole thing is to do with all these laws, logarithmic laws, mm -hmm. about sensory perception of rates of change, ten times uh, increase in stimulus strength. Uh, it usually represents in a two-fold increase in subjective stimulus, a hundred-fold, three-fold. It's a logarithmic scale mm -hmm. um, that the senses work on pretty universally. Well, I think this is right. This is good. This is a theory of the importance of holidays but Holiday there's days, still yeah. something wrong because through the annual repetition of Christmas which persists to this day the consciousness is still gone because there's not enough difference I guess every year Christmas is the same I mean people have have they not 
completely forgotten the significance of Christmas. It's possible to experience Christmas with full regalia of angels on the trees and so on, and still to not have any awakening into consciousness of lost archetypes. Well, that's precisely why Christmas is a child's festival, and why the delight of Christmas explains by everyone, the ideal archetypal delight of it is young children waking up on Christmas Day and seeing the stars and the angels and the sounds and the bells and the presents. And the magic of Christmas is considered to work for young children. Adults feel somewhat guilty about being jaded about it. And you know, there's a great impulse to recapture it through the delight of young children. And since it's a, a, a young children festival, it's a nativity festival. It's a child festival. It's a sacred child festival. Um, that's the pole that touches in us, the sacred child. Um, so I think that that's what that particular festival is about. And I think that it operates quite well in its way as, as a reminder of it and reactivating. So it works a few times. I think it has a particular, because of its ritual power, there are a lot of people who only go to church at Christmas, for example. It's very common in England, they, you know, in the Church of England, you have lots of people go at Christmas and Easter, you never normally go at all. Um, and so there, there are some people whose connection with the Christian faith is confined to these major seasonal festivals. And um, it therefore sort of still has a kind of the pulse, the basic ritual pulse of the seasonal festival year of the liturgical year is still alive, however sluggishly, in a lot of people. So it's not that most people have forgotten it. But one thing I think that one of the troubles with Terence and his suggestions is that they're usually, uh, the ideal state that he usually portrays, like his idea of moving over to an entirely lunar calendar to bring about feminine virtues and partnership values, um, his ideal predictions usually turn out to be of being realized and often refuted by the world of Islam. <laughs> <laughs> like the lunar calendar. That's true. And they were big on that. And the other thing is that they were big on banning alcohol. One of the most important hmm. Quranic prohibitions is on intoxicating drink. And the result, therefore, is that many Muslims, mainstream Muslim culture, and certainly on the surface of righteous Muslim life, alcohol is not consumed. But... In most Muslim societies, cannabis has been considered all right. It's still an intoxicant and still falls under a kind of Quranic prohibition, but not one that's taken as seriously as the prohibition of alcohol. That's right. No, that's a good point. You're right. So Islamic culture is a culture that the drug of which is cannabis, the large, largest part of the Islamic world, rather than alcohol. Yes, although whether Islam has a drug at all could be argued. I mean, perhaps the drug of the Islamic world is coffee. Caffeine is more typical of the state of mind we associate with most of the denizens of that part of the world rather than the affable states induced by cannabis. It's the shrill argumentative and mercenary arguments of the marketplace and coffee managed to take that basic foothold and write itself into every labor contract on earth. It's the only drug sanctioned by industrial capitalism in the form of the coffee break. <laughs> <laughs> they don't have smoking breaks, you mean, at factories no, in the Muslim never, world. That's right, they don't have cannabis breaks. Do they, they have cannabis parties on the weekend? And I think cannabis is associated with a mystical strain in Islam that's definitely minority and has and doesn't really it when it has shaped Islamic culture, it's been episodic and far in the past. <laughs>